This lesson is part two of section 10.4. Today we're going to be finding the dot product of two vectors, which we will define in just a second. And we are also going to find the angle between two vectors. So let's jump right in now to the algebraic definition of the dot product. If we are given two vectors, u and v, we define the dot product, u dot v, as follows. So let's break down what this is actually saying. Now all we're doing is finding the sum of two different products. So here I have the product of the horizontal components of the vectors, and here I have the product of the vertical components of the vectors. Now after you find those two products, you would add them, and then it's going to yield just a real number here. So that dot product will always yield a scalar real number, okay? which is also why it's referred to as a scalar product instead of just the dot product. So you might hear it called the scalar product as well. So let's begin with example one, which says find the dot product s dot t if s is negative 3, 4 and t is 2, negative 5. So we are going to find the product of the horizontal components, and we're also going to find the, the product of the vertical components, and then we're going to add those two products together. So we need to take negative 3 times 2, those are the horizontal components, plus 4 times negative 5, that's the product of the vertical components. So we end up with negative 6 plus negative 20, and we get negative 26. So the dot product, s dot t, is equal to negative 26. Again, re remember that this is always going to be a real number here, a scalar number. In example two, we're just using i and j notation, but it doesn't change how you're going to do this problem. Here I've got a horizontal component of 2 and a horizontal component of 3. So w dot m is going to equal 2 times 3 plus 2 times negative 3. So we have 6 plus negative 6, which gives me a... Uh, dot product of zero. Now this product here, this dot product of zero, is actually a special dot product. That it's going to tell us something about uh, these two vectors, which we're going to get to on the back side of our notes. So here are some of the useful properties of the dot product. Now in the first property, you can see that the dot product is commutative. u dot v is the same as v dot u. In the second property, you can see that the dot product distributes over addition. Now our third property is one that we're going to use in just a second, but this one states that if you take the, the dot product of a vector with itself, so if we have u dot u, this is going to yield another scalar, but this scalar is special. It's going to be the length of u squared. So remember, magnitude or length is denoted with those, those bars here. So we end up with the length squared. And finally, our last property demonstrates that the dot product is associative when you're dealing with a scalar multiplication. So here I've got a scalar multiplied by the dot product of u and v. Now I can rewrite this um, using the associative property here. If I were to take the scalar and multiply it by u first and then find the dot product, that would be equivalent to here. If I were to find just the dot product first and then multiply by that scalar. Um, we could also multiply that second vector here first with that scalar and then find the dot product of the resulting vector with the first vector. All right, so those are our properties that we're going to now put to use. So example three says the magnitude of a vector is seven, and what is v dot v? So let's start with the fact that the magnitude of this vector is seven. Therefore, let's write it like this. The magnitude is equal to seven, or the length of that vector is equal to seven. Well, if we want to find the dot product of that vector with itself, we are going to use property number three here. Okay, property number three states that if you take that, that dot product of the vector with itself, you will end up with the length squared. So we know that this vector's length squared, in other words, 7 squared, which is 49, should equal the dot product of v with itself. So there we have it. v dot v is equal to 49. Now number four is pretty similar to number three. We're still going to use that same property. Here it says suppose v dot v, so the dot product of v with itself, is equal to three. What is the magnitude of v? So remember, magnitude is just the length of v. Now we know that if we take the dot product of v with itself, that's going to yield the length of v squared, or the uh, magnitude squared. So if we want to find the magnitude of v, all we have to do is isolate this length here by taking the square root of both sides. So if I take the square root of both sides, now I have the square root of that dot product equaling the magnitude or length of v. So now I just make a substitution here, since I have the dot product is equal to 3 here. I'm going to substitute the v dot v here as 3, and now I have the length or magnitude of v. So if these seem pretty easy, I think they should. These algebraic interpretations of the dot product are, are fairly straightforward. You're just following you know, the formulas that, that I've given you so far. All right, now in the next portion of the lesson, we're going to use a different definition for the dot product, and this is the geometric interpretation. So we define it a little bit differently. 
u dot v is equal to the product of the lengths of u and v multiplied by the cosine of the angle between the two vectors. So theta is the angle between your two vectors. So now that you have these two different definitions for the dot product, you're going to have to decide between the two when you're actually answering questions. So it all depends on the context of the question. If the question asks you to find an angle measure, then obviously you have to use this particular um, formula. If the dot product is all that you're looking for and they give you um, the horizontal and vertical components, then obviously it'd be easier to use that algebraic definition that I gave you at the beginning of the lesson. So it's up to you, like I said, to decide which formula you're going to use. Now, um, on the back side of our notes, we're going to start with proving this dot product in this geometric interpretation, and then we'll answer some specific questions where you have to use this particular formula in order to answer the question. All right, so let's get started with our proof. It says, suppose that theta is the angle between two non-zero vectors as shown in the diagram below. So I'm just going to label this angle measure here as theta. Now I'm also going to create a third vector here. This is going to be the resultant of a minus b. So if I take vector a minus b, this would be the resultant vector there. Now instead of using um, the arrow notation on every single uh, uh, and in this proof, I'm just going to drop the arrow. So when I refer to vector a, just pretend like you, you know that that's bolded, okay? Because I can't really show that it's bolded like in here, vector u. But just pretend like it is. So here this vector will be referred to as a minus b. Now, because I just created that third vector here, I actually just created a triangle. And if I label the coordinates here, let's label that o for the origin, a for this endpoint here, and b for this other vertex. Now I have a triangle that I can relate the sides with the law of cosines. So I'm going to use the law of cosines in my proof. So based off the law of cosines, I know that if I take the length of this vector here, or which represents the length of the side of the triangle here, so if I take that length squared, so the vector a minus b, that length square that, that's going to equal the sum of the other two vectors here, the lengths of those two vectors, minus two times the product of those two vectors times the cosine of the angle between the vectors. So that's a lot of words here, but let's just write it out. So I've got the length of a, vector a here, squared plus the length of vector b squared, minus two times the product of the lengths of a and b, times the cosine of the angle between those two side lengths of your triangle or the two vectors, okay? So this is straight up just using the law of cosines. Now I'm going to focus on the left-hand side of this equation. Now based on one of the uh, properties of our dot product, we know that the length of a minus b squared, so this is a vector, a minus b, that length squared is equal to the dot product of that vector with itself. So if we take the vector a minus b and we find the dot product of that with itself, so I'm just going to put parentheses around it to show that this is just one vector here, um, that's equal to the length of a minus b squared. Now recall that the uh, dot product is also distributive over addition. So instead of looking at this as one vector, a minus b, the resultant, I'm going to think of these as two separate vectors, a and negative b, and a and negative b here. So that when I uh, find the dot product here, I can use the fact that it distributes over addition and write that as a times a minus b times a minus another b times a plus, since these b's are both negative, uh, b times b, okay? <clears throat> now if I just rewrite that, it looks just like I foiled it. Let's rewrite that as negative 2 times a times b, okay? All right, so what this is saying is you're taking the uh, dot product of the vector a with itself, and then the dot product, product of the vector b with itself, and then uh, subtracting 2 times the dot product of a and b, okay? Now, based off of, again, that same property that let us rewrite this as this, I'm going to go backwards, okay? I know that a dot, a dot a, okay, that dot product of a with itself is equal to the length of a squared. And I'm not going to rewrite this one at all, but the length of b squared is equal to the dot product of b with itself. So we've got plus the length of b squared. Now that I have this left-hand side rewritten like this, I'm going to make that substitution. So let's go back to this first statement here, and we're just going to substitute that vector length a minus b squared with this. Okay, so I've got a 
the le length of vector a squared minus 2 times the uh, dot product of a and b plus the length of vector b squared is equal to, and I'm going to write down here the right-hand side, the length of a squared plus the length of b squared minus 2 times the length of a times the length of b times the cosine of theta. All right, now, based off of the fact that I've got the same values on both sides of the equation, I can cancel a squared and a squared, as well as b squared with b squared. Now I'm left with negative 2 times the dot product of a and b is equal to negative 2 times the magnitude of a, or the length of a, times the magnitude or length of b, times the cosine of theta. Now from here I can divide out the negative 2's on both sides of the equation, so that I'm left with the dot product of a and b, is equal to the length of a times the length of b times the cosine of theta. So this is our second definition. This is the geometric interpretation of the dot product. So example five is a problem where you're still finding a dot product, but you have to use the geometric definition for the dot product because based off the information, you can't use the algebraic one. We're given the magnitudes of vectors u and v, and we're given the angle between u and v, but we are not given the horizontal and vertical components of either u or v. So we can't use that u dot v is equal to a1 times a2 plus b1 times b2. All right, that won't work here. So we're going to use that other geometric interpretation. So we know that that definition, the one we just proved, states that the dot product of u and v is equal to the magnitude of u times the magnitude of v times the cosine of the angle between. So let's just use substitution here. We've got the magnitude of u is 8, the magnitude of v is 5, and the cosine, the angle measure here, is 3 pi over 4. So now I have to evaluate this. So I have 40 times the cosine of 3 pi over 4. That's going to give me negative root 2 over 2. And if I multiply those, I end up with 20 times root 2, oops, sorry, negative 20 root 2. So this is the uh, scalar product here of the dot product u dot v. So I want you to notice that even though we use that geometric definition, we're still getting a scalar number here, okay? It doesn't matter if we use that algebraic or the geometric definition. We should get always, when we're asked to find a dot product, we should always get a uh, scalar. Now in problem six, we're asked to find the angle between two vectors. So we're finding the angle between the vector s and the vector t. And notice that we are given the horizontal and vertical components for s and t. But what we are going to do here is take a little twist on that geometric interpretation, that definition that we are just using here. We know that the dot product of u and v is equal to the length or the magnitude of u times the length or magnitude of v times the cosine of the angle between u and v. Now if I want to find the angle, that means I would have to isolate the cosine of theta here. And I would divide out that length of u and v here. So I have the dot product of u and v over the magnitude of u times the magnitude of v equaling the cosine of theta. Now if I want to further isolate and get theta alone, that means I'm taking the inverse cosine of the dot product of u and v over the length of u times the length of v. Okay, so that's actually what we're going to do here to find the angle between s and t. Now, obviously, I need to know a couple different things. I need to know the dot product of s and t, and I also need to know the magnitude of s as well as the magnitude of t. So the dot product, s dot t, is going to be found by taking 3 times 1 plus 0 times 6. So we have 3, so that's our dot product. Now the magnitude of s, remember that's the square root of the horizontal uh, component squared plus the vertical component squared, so that's 3 squared plus 0 squared. So we end up with a square root of 9, which is 3. The magnitude of t, same thing, I'm going to take the square root of, this time the horizontal component squared is 1 squared plus 6 squared. So I end up with the square root of 37, which I'm not going to do anything with because I can't simplify it. Alright, now I'm going to solve for theta. Um, you can always start with this, you know, you don't have to memorize this, it's just obviously a little bit of a shortcut if you know that it's the inverse cosine of the dot product, s dot t, and uh, over the magnitude of s times the magnitude of t, so let's rewrite that as the inverse cosine of s dot t, that dot product is 3, the magnitude of s right here, um, that one's equal to 3, times the magnitude of t, which is the square root of 37. Now if I simplify that, I have the inverse cosine of 1 over root 37, okay, and I'm just going to type that right into my calculator. 
All right, so I end up with the inverse cosine of 1 over root 37 is equal to, and I'll make sure that your mode is in degrees also, but that's 80.53 degrees. So this is approximately 80.5 degrees. So that's the angle between the vectors S and T. Now there's a new definition that we're going to talk about, and that's orthogonal vectors. So two uh, vectors are orthogonal, which is just another word for perpendicular, if the dot product of U and V is equal to 0. Okay. The reason why we use this different word orthogonal as opposed to perpendicular is that perpendicular implies an intersection. Right? If we talked about two lines, um, we would say that lines um, here S and T are perpendicular even if we don't draw it in space showing that they actually intersect because since a line goes on forever, we know that at some point these definitely will intersect. Well, vectors, um, they're, they're line segments with directions. So we've got here's vector S and here's vector T pretend like those would intersect at a 90 degree angle. Well, just because they don't actually show intersection, we can always equivalently uh, draw a new vector and translate t anywhere we want so that we would create um, you know, two perpendicular vectors here. We call that orthogonal because we don't necessarily have the vectors intersecting in space. Okay, so we use orthogonal as opposed to perpendicular. But that's the, uh, the definition. Now, coming back to how you tell if they're, they're orthogonal is here. The dot product must equal zero. Well, why does that actually work? So if the dot product is equal to zero, then we know that uh, the cosine of theta, which is equal to the dot product of u and v over the magnitude of u times the magnitude of v, well, that's now going to equal zero over the magnitude of u times the magnitude of v, which is just zero. So we have the cosine of theta equaling zero, which means theta is equal to the inverse cosine of zero. Well then theta has to equal something between zero and 180 degrees or zero to pi, um, remember because that's the uh, range of the inverse cosine function. So we end up with 90 degrees or pi over two, which means that the angle between these two vectors is 90 degrees. So it shows that these would be perpendicular, which we call orthogonal because they don't necessarily intersect. All right, let's finish off the lesson with question seven. It asks us to decide if the vectors are orthogonal to one another. Now in question A, I am given both vectors and I know the horizontal and vertical components for each, which means if I wanna find the dot product, I'm gonna use that really easy algebraic definition where I take the product of the horizontal components, so negative two times 15, and I add that to the product of the vertical components, five and six. So I have negative 30 plus 30, which is in fact equal to zero. So because our dot product A dot B is equal to zero, that means A and B are orthogonal to one another. Did I even spell that right? Oh, that's an O, orthogonal. All right, and then in question B, this is obviously not much different because here I, I just have I and J notation. I am given the horizontal and vertical components, so I would calculate that in a very similar fashion. So the dot product of C and D here is 5 times 3 plus negative 2 times 4. And in this case, I don't end up with 0. So this means that these two vectors are not orthogonal. Okay, so these are not orthogonal. Now I could put a slight twist on this question. I could ask you, um, given the I component, but not given the J component. So let's make that XJ. And here, let's keep that the exact same, 3i plus 4j. What would the uh, vertical component for vector c have to be in order for these two vectors to be orthogonal? Well, all you're going to do is set up your, your uh, dot product here the same way you normally would, but you can set it equal to 0. So the dot product of c and d should equal 0 in order for these two product, uh, vectors to be orthogonal. So we have the dot product here is 5 times 3 plus x times 4. And then obviously we're just solving for x. So we have 0 equals 15 plus 4x. Subtract the 15 and divide out the 4 and you end up with negative 15 fourths for x. And that is, of course, if they're asking you um, to find the vector component. Okay? All right, that's the end of the lesson. Nice job. I'll see you guys in class tomorrow.